My name is Serena. I'm a data scientist at Vardis Group. Um, we're a consulting firm specialized in everything data, and we operate in the US and Canada. Personally, I'm a senior consultant on the data science practice, and I work out of our Toronto office in Canada. And today I'm here to talk to you about improving law interpretability with NLP. Earlier this year, we were approached by a research group from the government of Ontario um, and worked on a project in collaboration with them. So they were interested in uh, leveraging NLP techniques to analyze linguistic patterns in the legislation and extract information that can be useful to the public. So we worked on a proof of concept based on some Ontario laws. Today I'm going to go over the objectives and the motivations behind this uh, project. And I'll give an overview of the challenges we face in the space and how we address them in terms of met methodology. And then we'll dive into the proof of concept, which is based on the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act and its regulation. So in order to understand what we're really trying to do and what the motivation is uh, behind the project, it's important to remember what we're working with. The dictionary definition of law is a rule made by a government that states how people may or may not behave in a society. So it seems that understanding laws is pretty important for everyone. Um, now, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to read a law here. Have you ever tried to go over a piece of law? It's not really fun. It's not that easy to understand. So what I mean when I say interpretability, um, uh, I, what I want to get at is find a representation of the rules that um, you're required to comply with and uh, make them more accessible and more understandable. So in this context, what we want to do is we want to be able to extract these rules and obligations from the text, identify the entities that are responsible for compliance, and then maybe look at things like, are they homogeneous across industries? Or can we tell the difference between public responsibility and private responsibility? Or can we identify parts that are unclear and can be written better? Our first challenge was we did not have a, a label set available. So we couldn't, write, we couldn't build a model that um, was using um, a training set. Uh, no one has sat down and went over the uh, laws of Ontario and like annotating them, saying this is the type of information that we want to extract and that's relevant. Um, so we don't have that, which limits our ability of building models, at least in a supervised kind of way. Um, then we have, on top of this, we have a few uh, challenges in terms of how we work with the text because the text is written in a specific way. Um, so for example, uh, laws are formatted in a very specific way. So they've got a lot of bullet points and a lot of references, and that actually breaks a lot of the standard parsing and tokenization algorithms. So that's our first problem. The language that they use is relatively structured, and the vocabulary is pretty is relatively limited, um, but very, very specialized, and it's very content-specific. So the same word can mean slightly different things, uh, depending on the words that it's surrounded by, or the, the context that it's used in. Uh, so that's also very important. Syntactic complexity is another problem. Sentences can be very long and nonlinear. It can be hard to understand exactly who's involved and what, what they're required to do. And then again, the very domain specific. Um, so a domain can be a geography or um, an industry. So if you take a law that is, uh, if you take a model, if you train a model and um, do that on a law that is uh, coming from the UK, it will be hard or not as easy to generalize it to um, the US, for example. So given these challenges, instead of training a single model, we built a framework for analysis. And this combines some pre-trained natural language processing models and then some unsupervised machine learning algorithms. The goal that we have is to extract information that is useful. And so we want to extract the rules. We want to identify the entities that are responsible for compliance with these rules. Um, and then we want to look at organizing rules in homogeneous groups. Um, and we'll look at what I mean by homogeneous groups a little um, later when we get to the use case. Before we go any further, I want to do a quick grammar refresher. Um, I'm going to use some jargon, and I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So in grammar, the subject of a sentence is the word or phrase 
that indicates who or what is performing the action of the verb. So in the context of law, this will point us at the entities that are responsible for compliance. On the other side, we have the object, and that's um, in grammar, the entity that is acted upon uh, by the subject. And in terms of law, it's the rule specification. So what is that the entity is required to do? In terms of technology, we used Spacey, which is a Python library. It's open source, and it comes with a number of neural models for several languages, including English. It's focused on performance and application in production, which means it has less functionalities in terms of um, NLP, in terms of NLP, and in terms of compared to um, other libraries in the space. But it's very fast and accurate, and it comes with a pipeline of NLP modules that are pre-trained and can be used out of the box or customized. So I want to go over uh, some of the modules of this NLP pipeline and why they're relevant to us. So as the text comes in, the first thing we're going to do is wanna, we're going to want to tokenize it. We're going to take it and split it into smaller pieces. Depending on the language that you're working with, this can be pretty simple. You can eliminate spaces and uh, punctuation. Uh, but for example, if you have a, uh, a, a short form, if you have um, orange, for example, you have to make a decision in terms of, do you want to split it at the apostrophe? Do you want to consider it a single token? Or do you want to split it in some different way? So there's some decision making uh, involved here. Next, we're going to want to use a lemmatizer. And what, the lem uh, what a lemmatizer does is simply mapping words to their root or base form. So if you have a verb that is conjugated, and you have M, R, or E, what really matter is not what the what the token itself looks like, but what the reference from a semantic standpoint is. And so they all map back to E's, uh, to B. Next, we'll do parts of speech tagging. So we'll assign each word to a part of speech category, where a part of speech is a group of words that have similar grammatical properties. These are things like verbs and nouns and adjectives. And then the last step that we're interested in is the dependency parser. The dependency parser determines the grammatical structure of the sentence. So it builds a trees of dependencies where it identifies head words and then words that modify them. So just to look at a quick example, if we load a, the English model in Spacey and pass a simple sentence to it, um, the model will automatically take it and tokenize it, find the lemma of the words, um, attach parts of speech tags, and attach the, do the, build the dependency tree and attach the dependency parser tree. Um, and then it attaches a, a, flag, a, a bunch of flags that are useful um, in the analysis. The one that I have up here is stop words because it will turn, it will be useful later on. If you're not familiar with them, uh, a stop word is essentially a word in a language that is used so frequently that instead of adding information, actually adds noise. So if we look at this sentence and we take out is and a, which are the stop words here, we're left with this and sentence. And so you might sound a little bit like a toddler, but you're still pretty clear and makes sense. To understand parts of speech and dependency uh, parsing, it's useful to look at the tree itself. So on the bottom of the picture, you can see the parts of speech tag. Here we have some determinants, we have a verb, and we have a noun. And then the arrows identify the relationships between the head word, which is the verb, and then on one side, the subject, and on the other side, an attribute. And you can see how the tree doesn't have to follow the order of the words in the sentence. So said that, we can go into the proof of concept. For this use case, we use the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. This is a statute and a regulation that were passed in Ontario in 2015, um, and define rules and requirements for accessibility for people with disabilities. And it also sets out a process for eliminating barriers. So in this context, what we're interested in is uh, burdens. A burden is a requirement for, or an obligation that organizations have to comply with. So in the context of accessibility, this can be a physical or an architectural barrier, so your stairs and your ramps and all of these like physical obstacles to accessibility, but it can also be referring to 
uh, documentation and training. So we'll split the analysis into three stages. First of all, we want to identify the burden. So we want to go over the text and extract the sentences that are relevant. Then we want to identify the subjects of the sentences. So what, which are the entities that are responsible for them? And then at the end, we'll run some clustering on the subjects to see if we can find some regularities and some like, way of explaining what the law is requiring. Step one, we want to, again, go over the sentences in the legislation, and we want to find the ones that express a rule or a burden for uh, an organization. In this case, the fact that the law has a relatively limited vocabulary actually works in our favor. So we were able to identify a short list of verbs that were definitely going to point us at burdens. And these are shall, must, require, and oblige. So what, what our expectation is, if the sentence contains one of these verbs, it's very likely to be an, a burden. And then we use WordNet to expand this group. WordNet is a graph dictionary of the English language, so um, it essentially takes words and groups them together uh, based on their grammatical properties and their concept they're expressing. And then these groups are connected to each other by semantic relationships, so that can be synonym and antonyms, for example. So we take our initial group of verbs and combine them with their synonyms and build a lightweight ontology. Now ontologies identify, are used to identify entities and their relationships between, um, between each other. In this, case, in this case, we'll call it a lightweight ontology because we, we're really just defining the burdens, but we could add more types of, uh, of rules that we want to identify. So we take each sentence, extract the lemma from the tokens, um, and then if the lemma is included in our list, in, in our ontology, then we label that sentence as a burden. This is a pretty coarse classification rule. So we did want to know how well we were doing. And so we actually sat down and labeled the sentences in the text, which wasn't very fun. Um, <laughs> uh, but it wasn't terrible. It's not a very long piece of legislation. Um, and it did allow us to uh, come up with some performance metric. So the first one is accuracy. We want to know overall, going over the sentences, what's the proportion of them that's being correctly labeled. So it doesn't matter whether they were burdens or not. We just want to know if we picked them right. And that's 89%. And then we want to know of all the burdens that we, were, we have in the text, how many of them were correctly labeled as, as burdens. And that's 97%, which for a simple business rule, I think it's pretty good. So now we want to identify the subjects of the burden. And so by subject, I mean the grammatical subject, so the uh, entity that performs the action in the sentence. Um, and so we should be able to use dependency parsing. Um, you don't need to remember all this, um, this tags. Just know that there's a few different ways that subjects can be tagged in terms of dependency tree. But before concluding that this is going to be easy, let's look at the, an example. Um, so, in this sentence, the subject of the the subject is obligated organizations that are school boards or educational or training institutions. So, what the dependency tree does, it tags organizations as the subject, and that's correct. But it doesn't actually help us qualify what organizations are required to keep record of the training. And so, if you look at the tree. Um, we have that keep is the main verb, and then on one side we have the object, which are the records to be kept, and on the other side it points at the subject, which is the organizations, but then there's all these other words that actually are telling us what the entity is really. And so what we really want is this entire side of the tree. So we still use the dependency parsing results to identify the, the word, the head word of the subject, but then we use breadth first search to navigate the dependency tree and find all the subsets of tokens that are related to the subject by a parent-child relationship. And that's going to uh, let us know what the uh, entire phrase is. So now we have identified 
uh, who's carrying the responsibilities for the burdens. And we want to see if we can find, uh, if we can organize them into homogeneous groups. Before doing that, we're going to have to represent the, the burdens in, um, in a vector space so that we can manipulate it uh, with some algorithm. Um, and then we can look at this, uh, see if we can find homogeneous groups. At this point, we're still not entirely sure what we're looking for. Uh, but we are looking for any kind of pattern or regularity. Although we had some goals, we wanted to see whether we could tell the difference between public and private responsibility, for example. So what is the government and what is the government, what are its agencies uh, required to do, what, is, uh, what responsibilities are businesses, for example. Or we were interested in similarities between or across industries. So at this point, we still have substrings, and so we just have words. Uh, so we need to, uh, first we want to normalize the, or the subjects, and so we'll do some, we use lemmatization to uh, map to a base form, and then we'll drop the subwords because we don't want any noise. Um, and then we'll project into a vector, uh, into a vector space. Um, and before running the clustering, we'll run some dimensionality reduction. So I'm going to skip this, the first step. Sentence normalization is pretty straightforward. Um, and we'll jump into vector representation. So for this step, we use the GOV, uh, which stands for uh, Global Vectors for Word Representation. It's, a, it's an, a word embedding model trained and published by the Stanford NLP group. And what it does is it creates a semantic space. So words that are similar in meaning will also be close to each other in the vector space. And there's a famous example that you might have heard of. So if you take the um, vector for a king and subtract, subtract the vector for man, and then sum the vector for woman, you get the vector for queen. So that's what we're using. We're taking each word in our subjects, and we're projecting it into the glove space. But we still have multiple vectors representing a single thing, which is our subject. Uh, so we average over the words in the subject to get a single representation for it. Glove vectors come in various sizes, um, and even um, we use the smallest one, which is 50 dimensions, but it's still pretty large for what we're working with, which is a group of about 500 burdens. So we run spectral embeddings to um, go down from a higher dimensional space into a lower dimensional space. Um, spectral embedding starts from uh, representing points on a graph. So points that are close to each other are connected by an edge. And then there's some fancy math, and data points that are close to each other in the original space are represented close to each other into the lower dimensional space, uh, preserving the local distances. So if we look at the picture, uh, we can see the first two spectral embeddings, um, and it looks pretty good. It has this three pointy shapes that are coming um, out of the plot, and that's pretty promising considering we're trying to tell the difference between these data points. So for the next step, we use k-means. Um, so k-means uh, has the goal of partitioning the data points into k clusters. And it does so by assigning each data point to the cluster that has the nearest mean. So what that, our goal here is to uh, form groups uh, such that the variance between, uh, within groups is going to be much lower than the variance uh, between groups. So if we're taking two data points around the same group, they're going to be very close, very similar to each other. If we're taking two data points from different groups, they're going to be pretty different. And if we're done this correctly, then we're going to be able to look at the average of the clusters or the centroids, and we can use, the, we can use them as prototypes for the group. So we don't need to look at every single data point. We can just look at one per group. Now, there isn't a golden rule for deciding how many clusters you're going to look for. But we do know that we want this um, variability within groups to be low. So we run k-means um, for uh, several values of k. And every time, we measure inertia. So inertia is the sum of square of the distance for each data point from the closest uh, mean. And so we want this inertia to be going down as we increase the number of clusters. So the heuristic that we use is called the ALBA method. It's a relatively popular technique for um, deciding how many clusters you're going to use. Uh, 
Um, and so you can see that as you go down, um, as, as you go up in number of clusters, the inertia goes down. And we're going to pick the number of clusters for which if we add complexity to the system and add another cluster to explain, um, inertia is going to have a marginal improvement. And so that's three for us. And then looking at the uh, picture below, we can see that those three pointy shapes effectively cluster together and represent three different groups. So I already mentioned that we don't have a specific expectation for what the groups would look like. Uh, but we do know that we want to look at the centroid. So from now on, we're, gonna, we're only going to look at the average of the groups. And we're going to uh, summarize them by looking at the TF-IDF score. TF-IDF stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. So we take the frequency of the word in a document, which in our case is a uh, sentence, and we weight it by the inverse document frequency, which is proportional to the number of sentences where the word is used overall. So what happens is for words that appear in many sentences, the score will go down, which makes sense because we, it, it's less helpful for us to, tell, to help us tell the difference between them. So the picture uh, shows the average TF-IDF for the top words in each group. The number is absolutely random. It's just because of the screen size. Um, so you can look at more or less. But what's, in, what's important in this picture is that the three groups are completely separated and there's no overlapping in the distribution of the top TF-IDF. So that's good. Um, Looking into the single groups, um, so we're looking at the average TF-IDF for the first group for the uh, top 10, 20 words. It's a pretty skewed distribution, um, and we can see that, I don't know if it's readable from far away, probably not. Um, so the first three words, uh, the ones that have the, the highest score, they're uh, transportation, service, and provider. So about 21% of the burdens that we found um, are clustered in this group, and um, they mostly come to uh, they mostly come from this transportation standards um, section of the law. There isn't anything here that tells us um, whether there's a difference between public and private responsibility, which makes sense. We're not expecting there to be um, conceptually we're not expecting it to be different between one or the other. So this distribution is a little less skewed. It's a little bit closer to the uniform distribution. Um, most of the words uh, here are referring to physical objects. Um, the, the top two are surface and ramp, but then we have others like trail and stair. Um, so this is 25% of uh, the total burdens. And they're mostly referring to physical barriers and public spaces. So again, there's no difference between public and private, and we don't say why. The last group is a little harder to read. Um, organization is the word that has the highest score by far in the group. And then there are some words that point at uh, public figures or um, the public sector. So there's minister, municipality. Um, but then there's others that are more ambiguous. So um, director, employer, um, person, we can't really tell whether there's a difference between public, public and private. Um, however, they're all pointing at administration, compliance, and standards. Um, so this is about half of the legislation. So to pull everything back together, we've learned that the difference between public and private responsibility isn't very clear. We found that there's a strong focus on physical barriers and transportation, um, which makes sense. About half the legislation is focused on this. And we also found there's a large proportion dedicated to administration and standard definitions. But we also found that in this group, there's a bit more ambiguities in terms of where the responsibility is falling, whether it's a government responsibility or it's a private responsibility. So 
we started with uh, without having a, a labeled training set, and uh, but we were still able to uh, do a few things. We were able to automate the extraction of rules. Um, we found um, almost all the burdens in the text. Um, we were able to extract the subject of the grammar of, of the sentence, and um, that allowed us to identify the entities that were responsible for um, complying with this rule. So the entities that are affected by the legislation. And then we were able to organize, organize rules into homogeneous groups that allow us to understand what's the focus of the legislation and even identify parts of it that are um, not so clear and need more clarification. So this was a proof of concept. Uh, so it's limited in scope. And there's just probably more work that can be done to further refine the information that is extracted. However, it can be generalized and applied to any legislation into any context, into any domain. And so it's a first step towards coming up with a representation of laws that is abstract and can serve uh, the purpose of improving interpretability in at least a couple of ways. So on one hand, we have uh, the ability to extract information and summarize it so that rules and obligations are more clear to those that need to follow it. So whether you're an organization that has a, a legal department or you're a regular person, this is going to be helpful to um, be able to put things in boxes and understand where um, the information is. And then on the, on the other end, we have lawmakers. Um, and so this can be useful to identify um, parts of the law that are uh, ambiguous and could be written a different way or need to be clarified. And so in a way, we have an instrument that can be used for explain and understand uh, existing regulation, but also uh, find ways to write better laws that um, are, so that our lawmakers can use them to um, write legislation that is more accessible and more, more understandable for everyone. Thank you. I think we have time for questions if there's there are any. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you said that you identified some of the ambiguities around summarizing the data set and actually resulted in some changes to the legislation. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question if just to make sure that everyone hears it, the question is if um, identifying the ambiguities was helpful in changing the legislation. Um, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. What was the government of Ontario thinking? Um, they have a number of ideas of how they could use it. One of them was to um, sort of had two ways. So if you're um, if you're a user reading some media articles about some legislation change, for example, it would be useful. It would be very useful to have this like abstract representation that allows you to go from the from the media article to the legislation itself. Um, and which is really hard to do normally because the language use is so different. Um, so that one, that's one of the uses. The other use possibly, um, if you are the government and want to know and understand what's going on in the media conversation, that's also another way to do it. They wanted to. Um, they were really exploring how this this. This, the ecosystem of the techniques can be used in terms of helping pub, the public understanding. So there's a lot of research and a lot of models that are used in terms of uh, in the legal space, but they're generally to um, facilitate legal work in terms of lawyers' work. This is not at all about that. It's really more about understanding the patterns and whether they can be leveraged to find regularities. And so use those regularities to uh, literally classify this um, uh, rules in a way that make more sense. Or for example, identifying um, duplicates, um, bur a burden that are duplicates across different legislation. So if you've established a burden in, in AODA and you're establishing in some other regulation, there's no need to repeat it. And so that would make the legislation more lean. 
over? Yes. <laughs> Okay, just to repeat that, um, can we use the our work to actually label a, a training set, a, label this set and then use it as a training set in the future? Mm, I'm not sure, honestly. I think it's pretty small to, it's still pretty small and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't go as far as using it as a training set. Uh, we did label it um, manually, but I don't, I wouldn't trust myself too much. Like I said, I like it's not that easy to read. And so a lot of the sentences were pretty ambiguous. It's like, is this a burden really? Or is it just like, come on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, uh, I, I saw that one over there for first. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Did we experiment with other methodologies in terms of um, vector space and clustering? We did. Um, I personally like working with k-means a lot because it's easy to understand, um, and I think a big part of this was to be understandable. So I didn't want to use anything particularly complex or hard to interpret. Um, so that's definitely part of the motivation between, uh, behind k-means. Um, in terms of embeddings, um, I think ideally you'd want to um, train your own vector, uh, word vectors. Um, it, it, but in, in this case, we didn't have the time or the, the scope for it. And so I picked Glove because it seemed to have, uh, to lead to results that were more um, understandable and made more sense. Um, so that happens a lot when you're doing things like clustering, um, because again, there's no like expected results. So a clustering result is as good as you can. Like, if it makes sense to you, then it's a good clustering. Uh, here. Uh, so we did the clustering after dimensionality reduction. Did we try and flip it? Um, so the reason why we did dimensionality reduction was that if you take 500 burdens over 50 dimensions, the, the space is very sparse, and so you can't really see a lot of similar. It's very hard to see similarities. So the dimensionality reduction needs to be before. Yeah. That's oh, right over there. Mm-hmm. Um, did I find if, did I run this on French legislation because we're talking about Canada? Uh, <laughs> and um, the answer is no, I did not. <laughs> but it would be a really interesting thing to do. Um, yeah, in terms, you know, we didn't have scope for doing that, but I would definitely keep that in mind. It's a good idea. Yeah. You had a question? Um, is there any open source material about this? Yes, there is. Um, there's a workshop that I gave at a different location earlier this year, and there's a notebook for it. So I can point you at that if you're interested, for sure. Yeah. Over there. Is there any, sorry, let me repeat that. Um, is there any standard outcome of this analysis? Not really. Again, it's um, because I, I think I wanted to live it more as a framework for analysis, like things that you, like a, a process to follow so that you can get information out. Again, because you're not, you're looking for, um, you, you don't have a set expectation of what you want to extract. Um, I think that's a, better way of approaching the problem. So leave it open and let the data talk to you. Um, if you do have specific goals and want to extract specific type of information, I think there's, there are different models and different approaches that can do that.
I'm sorry, I need to repeat that, but I'm not sure I'm understanding the question completely. Would this lead to a domain specific text processing? When you say domain, do you mean legal or? That's a good question. I think it's probably generic enough that you could, I would try and up, uh, approach a problem in a different, a similar problem in a different industry with a similar uh, mindset, with a similar sort of process, and then take it from there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say this is specific to law. It was designed with the problems of law in, in mind, though, for sure. Is it specific to Canada or is it apply applicable in other um, geographies? I think it's applicable in other geographies. I've had some conversations about it. Um, I don't know that I can say any more than that. <laughs> but yes, I think it's possible, yeah. And I don't think it's language specific either. Yeah. Okay, thank you.